Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors, guys. We got another exciting one for you today. Uh, today we are joined by Mike Kirkland. He's the Senior Invasive Animal Biologist for the South Florida Water Management District. And we are going to talk about the python issue there. So how you doing, Mike? Good evening. I'm well. How are you guys? Doing pretty good, man. Doing good. Well, thanks for having me on. Hey, we're, we're happy to have you. So um, I, I personally don't know much about the python invasion going on down there. I mean, obviously, I know about it. But in terms of details and, you know, anything about the animal itself, I don't really know much about. I had snakes growing up, but, you know, we had ball pythons and, you know, garter snakes and whatever else. But obviously, they don't get to the size that the Burmese pythons do. So what exactly is the issue there? Sure. So it's a big one. Um, <laughs> um Right now, we're looking at about a uh, 95% reduction of fur-bearing animals in Everglades National Park and uh, the surrounding natural areas all due to the Burmese python invasion. Oh, wow. Burmese pythons are one of the largest species of snake in the world. They're from Southeast Asia, and they were introduced to Florida through the exotic pet trade business. Because of South Florida's subtropical environment and uh, the uh, marsh habitat of the Everglades, it uh, really closely mirrors the habitat in, in this animal's native range. So pythons are illegal to own. Burmese pythons are illegal to own in Florida now. But that legislation didn't come into place until... Um, about 12 years ago, and not soon enough to prevent uh, this invasive species from becoming established. So, like you like you said, they get really, really big, up to 20 feet long or, or more. And oh, wow. when they're small, like a ball python, if you've had a ball python before, you know they don't get beyond five or six feet long. And mm-hmm. the, but a Burmese python can get to be seven feet long in its first year alone. Oh, and wow. once it starts to get, you know, into 15, 16 feet plus feet long, it becomes impractical to own for a lot of people. You know, that's a lot of space and resources and food that needs to go to support that animal. So through what we believe is a combination of accidental and intentional releases, um, you know, somebody can't keep this animal any longer. They think they're doing it a favor and they put it into the environment and not realizing the repercussions that could have. And now we have a very large reproducing population in South Florida and it's just devastating our native wildlife in the Everglades. Jeez. That is insane. I didn't realize they can grow seven feet in their first year. That is, yeah. I mean, I don't know That's any impressive. animal that has a growth rate like that. That's insane. It all depends on how many prey items they're getting. They're extremely resilient animals, and and that's one of the issues that we have with management. They can eat once a week, or they can go over a year without eating at all. They're um, known to be ambush predators, though we have been observing them foraging for food as well. So they can just sit and basically lie dormant um, indefinitely, it seems like, until some food comes along. You know, a prey item comes along, they can eat whatever they can fit into their mouth. And once you get to be seven feet long, you're, um, you know, already starting to exceed any native snake species in Florida. And uh, pythons, you know, in the first couple of years quickly become apex predator in the Everglades. They're, um, they can take down deer and even alligators. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've seen a few pictures of of them chowing on an alligator. And Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's crazy because everybody thinks, you know, the alligator is the predator there. But to know that there's something else that's much larger that is... It can be a a 50-50 battle sometimes. You know, alligators definitely uh, went went out some of the times. But it's it's incredible. And uh, that's become a real issue. 
Yeah, there was a uh, there was a photo circulating around a few years back of a um, I think it was like a seven or eight foot alligator that had been eaten by a python in an airboat or something had ran it over and like burst it open. But they found a dead python with a uh, with a dead pretty sizable dead gator inside of it. So oh yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty 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 crazy what these animals are capable of. It is. I, you know, when I, my wife and I first moved to Florida um, almost 20 years ago, you know, I'd heard of the Python invasion, of course, but um, I had no idea, you know, that it would be capable of reproducing like it has and become the destructive force that it, that it has. Yeah. And now, you know, for the last uh, seven plus years of my life, I've dedicated my life day and night to try to protect our native wildlife here. You know, I, I'm a snake lover. Uh, you know, these are beautiful animals. They're here through no fault of their own. But um, the, the destruction that they're causing, the ecological collapse that they're causing the Everglades um, is what motivates me and my team and, my, and our partners to uh, conduct these robust management efforts that I'll be talking about. Yeah. So in terms of ecological impacts, so obviously it, it uh, makes differences with the, you know, local fur bearing population of other animals, whether it be, you know, smaller or larger, does it have any effect on the, you know, ecology of the homes of the other animals as well? Like, does it have any other, other problems in terms of wherever it nests or anything like that? That's a great question. And I don't know that we have, you know, all those answers. There's a lot we don't know about the python and it's here in florida and it's non-native range but they've definitely been found in gopher tortoise burrows and uh they certainly have uh the uh potential to displace other native wildlife here but we don't have a lot of data i don't think of uh pythons just geographically displacing other animals they're I think that's because we've been spending all of our time um, dealing with them eating all the other animals. But um, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot that we're still trying to, that we need to learn about them. I see. So you, I know you mentioned there's been a reduction of um, by about ninety five percent in the fur bearing animals. What about uh, what about bird communities and uh, or other reptiles or even even the fish communities as well? Have they been impacted? Sure. Uh, we don't have any records of um, pythons impacting um, fish communities, though the textbooks say that Burby's pythons do eat fish. I don't know of any records of Florida that are happening, you know, um, and I'd have to check the uh, latest diet analyses to see if fish are in there. I don't remember seeing any fish, but we, we certainly don't know anything about um fish populations being impacted but wading birds in particular uh we've there's been multiple species of wading birds found in um, the stomachs of pythons and um direct observations of pythons um attacking wading bird colonies so we we believe that's kind of the, the next um thing on on the list but um like I said before, as long as you know it can fit in a python's mouth, then it's pretty much fair game to be preyed upon. That's but we don't have any we don't have any data of you know what types of impacts to wading bird colonies pythons are causing. We just mm -hmm. know that they are indeed um, preying on wading birds, including you know listed species like uh, like the wood stork, for instance. Oh wow! Have, have there been any um, like recorded attacks on humans who might be visiting the Everglades or anything like that? N not in Florida, and um, only uh, a couple of instances uh, known worldwide in their native range. There's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware of only one, maybe two uh, instances where um, a human was. Uh, attacked and, and killed by Burmese python. I, I think it was in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, it's obviously extremely rare, and it's clear mm -hmm. that um, pythons don't view humans as uh, one of their normal prey sources. 
That's Jeez. at least one good thing about it. Because <laughs> that could be horrible if human were a main diet. <laughs> Obviously, people ask me that all the time. They're concerned yeah. for their, their children. And um, uh, well, pythons are semi-aquatic. You, you'll find them in or near the water. And I always tell people, you know, you should um, be watching your kids, whether there's pythons down here or not, near any waterways in Florida, right? You know, we have a lot of alligators and um, and definitely we have several fatalities every year uh, from alligators in Florida. But pythons aren't considered to be uh, a threat to humans in South Florida. They're really a threat to our native wildlife in the Everglades. And you don't see them often in urban areas either, it's, you know, um, occasionally, but um, it seems like they, they want to stick to the natural areas of the Everglades. It's their habitat preference. So what is their behavior like? Are they, do they climb trees? Are they typically ground bearing or are they, uh, you know, you said they're semi-aquatic. So can you find them land, water, vegetation? Where, where are they most likely found? That's another great question. So they have, uh, you know, their core population covers you know, thousands of square miles down here. And it's a diverse landscape from uh, cattail marshes to sawgrass prairies to cypress tree stands. It's a really diverse landscape down here. We do see them in trees occasionally, but usually they're either in the water or, or close by. They use upland areas to reproduce, to to, um, to nest. They will lay their eggs in hidden subterranean locations and also to search for food. But they spend a lot of their... Um, life in the water and you know big heavy bodied animal like that um it's easy for them to to move in the water so so these animals are obviously photos outside of their their native range have you noticed any differences in their ecology uh their life history and their behaviors in florida versus their native range like maybe in terms of clutch size or how often they they are capable of breeding and um Maybe even seasonality of breeding, anything like that. Wow, you guys have some really impressive questions. Uh, the short answer is uh, yes. It seems like we're starting to notice uh, some potential um, adaptations to this their new environment here in South Florida. Pythons usually um, in their native range um, will have, uh, re- you know, when they're of um, reproductive maturity, will uh, have clutches of eggs typically every two years and we have have seen that here as well but we're starting we've we've seen um pythons starting to have clutches every year and this is kind of anecdotal right now but um it would seem that there are some adaptations to this new range and that is a concern because we're if they're able to adapt to uh, colder temperatures, then you know we could be looking at more northern population expansion, which um, you know Georgia certainly doesn't want to hear about. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're to keep this contained to a Florida issue, which right now it certainly is. But um, yes, we we are seeing some potential adaptations to their non-native range here, but right now that's mostly anecdotal. Wow. See. So how long does it take for them to reach reproductive maturity? It depends how many prey items they get. So, um, you know, with humans, it's based on age, and a lot of animals it's based on age. For, for pythons, uh, it depends uh, on their size. And once they get to be, say, around seven feet long, typically they're of uh, reproductive maturity. And it all depends on how successful they are at uh, finding prey items. So if there's a really successful python, they can reach sexual maturity within their first year or a little yes. after. Yeah. One wow. to two years, typically. Oh, wow. Jeez. Or two years is more more the norm. How large is their clutch, typically? Again, that depends on the size of the animal, it seems, but uh, anywhere from 40 to 100 eggs in a clutch. Oh, wow. And we're... S- We've seen a um, very high success rate for 
the for the eggs of these clutches to hatch. But we've done several um, survivorship studies of, of hatchlings from cradle to grave type studies, and all of them agree that it, there's about a 95% mortality rate for uh, python hatchlings. Even though they've wow. eaten so much of the native wildlife, there's still plenty uh, plenty left that preys on the hatchlings. You know, they're when they're born out of the egg, they're already about two feet long. So they're already, you know, <laughs> longer than a lot of our native snakes down here. But um, um, they're easy pickings at that point in their life. And so few will, from a clutch, will make it to adulthood. I see. So, so what's that? Uh, the typical, I guess, gestation period for a for a python. So um, it's a couple of months for gestation, and then uh, incubation is two to three months after that. Hmm. And I guess what what also is like the threshold from the time they hatch to like when they when their chances of mortality start to decrease, like when they have a pretty good chance of of making it. You think from the time they hatch to is there a certain size? Another great question. Um, these are some original questions too. And I, you know, I talk to, um, I get interviewed a lot. Uh, I don't think we have all those answers. Um, mm-hmm. The the several survivorship studies that I mentioned um, uh, all were over fairly quickly, and um, and I don't think we were able to track um, a python actually reaching adulthood because um, almost all of them seem to be. Um, you know, had mortality events before before that happened. So, uh, great question, and that, that's something where we're trying to learn. Still, mm-hmm. cool. What is the typical lifespan of a Burmese python? And I know that varies, of course. You know, between you know their location, where they're at, their in na- their native habitat, or if they're you know obviously not out in the wild if they're in captivity. But um, is there kind of a bow range? Definitely seems variable, but um, I, I think the general consensus is uh, around thirty years. Oh wow! Thirty years! Wow, that's a long lifespan. Yeah. Do y'all have a record of what the oldest one y'all have captured or uh, removed? Getting the determining the age of a python is um, is tricky business, um, and. So no, we don't. You know, we have some pretty good guesses out there of, um, you know, but we. So you know, all the it seems to be measured in size, and um, you know, we the latest record by length was nineteen feet long. I think is a, is a record right now in Florida, and then by mass, um, the the record python is. Um, I think it's. 210 pounds, something like that. God bless. And it's just a, a huge animal. And that was captured by um, some close colleagues of ours over in Collier County. That was the Conservancy of Southwest Florida that removed that dragon from the environment. But I don't think that we know or if there's a good way to tell how old they are. So we know we can we can assume that an animal that size, you know, is over 10 years old. Right. But we really don't know. It's not like um, um, counting rings on a tree or something like that. But it's a good question. and I, I'd like to follow up with um, maybe some veterinarians to see if there's anything that can be done with like bone densities, things like that. Yeah, that would be interesting. That's a yeah, big, well, sure. <clears throat> that's a massive animal. I couldn't even imagine what it would be like to see a snake that size. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. My personal record is um, 17 feet, three inches. Holy and cow. I've been catching snakes all my life, uh, but I'm not from Florida. I'm from rural Maryland. And you know, so I'm used to catching like, black rat snakes and things like that. Yeah. And um, uh, when I, but you know, I am a snake catcher. And now I'm a python catcher as well. I say it takes an honorary python hunter to manage a group of them, but um, <laughs> when I saw this animal out in the field, it was just, I'd never seen anything like it. And, um, I, it gave me pause for just a just a second when I just appreciated the size of this animal. But I caught her up, you know. Um, uh, you know, they're non venomous species, obviously, and um, you know you definitely want to avoid their bite. You know, they have a, a mouth, a recurve teeth that you definitely want to avoid. 
But, you know, if you are a professional snake catcher, it's not a huge deal to catch a python. Um, you know, one that size uh, definitely has a lot of strength to it. They're all muscle. So um, I guess it requires a little bit of strength and some technique to remove these things. But that one I caught um, a few years ago, and it remained in the top 10 for a couple of years here in Florida, but just recently, I, I think it's been bumped to number 12 or something like that. I know other people wow. with records that get all upset. Uh, <laughs> they take it personal when, they're, when, they're, when, they're, when their record is broken, but uh, uh, we're, we're just happy that animals are getting removed from the environment. So right. what, what's it like handling an animal that large and that strong? I, I imagine it's just got to be otherworldly. You know, there was a lot of adrenaline you know, when I caught that, that big one, um, and snakes only have one lung and humans obviously have two. And so when you're kind of doing a dance and cause you have to get it under control, once you grab the head and, um, you know, keep it from biting you, then you have to deal with the rest of the body. Right. And, mm -hmm. and they're trying to get away from you. Just like you would try to escape if somebody was trying to grab you up. Um, you know, do they try to put their coils around you? They'll do whatever they can to try to get you off of them, right? And so this was in July, I think was my capture, and it's super hot outside, and I was sweaty and excited and was easily able to, you know, slip out of the coils and, and keep the head under control. But after about 20 minutes, she calmed down. But uh, I also, even with my second lung, was exhausted at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes fighting with an animal that is, you said it was 17 feet. 17, three 17, three. Man, that's like a, that's like a pay-per-view fight. <laughs> I'll send you guys a picture. That'll be the picture I send you. Be holding that. that's, that's my best catch so far. I keep that, the skin of that catch, um, over my, um, on the wall above my office at our headquarters. And it's just kind of a stark reminder of, um, you know, what we're up against out there. That's crazy. So talking about the skin and, and harvesting and stuff like that, is there a table fair? Like it, do people eat them? They do mm. in their native range. Okay. They certainly do. In fact, they py Burmese pythons are declined in their native range due mostly to over harvesting by humans. I see. But um, here the Everglades is a natural sink for mer mercury mm. and mercury accumulates um, bioaccumulates to the trophic levels. And so anything at the top of the food chain in the Everglades is going to be high in mercury. And we've done a couple of studies on Burmese pythons and depending where you're at, but um, we found that they seem to be dangerously high in mercury and we do not consider them to have any food value here, wow. which is too bad because that definitely helps, you know, encourage them to be removed. Like lionfish, you know, is a huge invasive um, mm -hmm. animal problem in our waterways. And, uh, you know, they put them on menus in local restaurants, and that has helped reduce their population. But uh, we can use their skins, and, you know, all my Christmas presents that go out to people <laughs> are always python, <laughs> Everglades python skin products. And so, you know, they, they, the skins are beautiful. They make nice products, and, you know, I would never buy a something uh, from um, uh, a python taken from its native range, but here in the Everglades, it helps support uh, our important environmental mission down here. And, um, and it makes me feel better knowing the animal didn't completely go to waste. Right. Right. So I noticed that in your job title, your job title, it was uh, your title was invasive animal biologist, I, I believe. So do you work with other invasives like iguanas or is your main, I guess, focus animal, the, uh, the, the Python? So uh, the South Florida water management district ha is the largest of five water management districts in the state, the largest and the oldest And our area of responsibility is uh, 16 counties. And so that's my area of responsibility and mm -hmm. any invasive animals of significance that happen and occur in our, um, in our jurisdictional region um, are going to come across my desk. The mm. Python issue is so big that, uh, you know, it takes, it certainly takes up most of my time, but we definitely, um, and, and my, my staff, I only have uh, one other person 
uh, working directly under me at at the agency. We do a lot of work, just two people, but um, you know we can only do so much. But I definitely deal with other invasive animals. Iguanas are certainly on that list. The Argentine black and white tegu is on the list. Uh, Nile monitors. I don't have enough. Um, staff and time to become um, experienced with fish yet you know i mentioned lionfish but i don't directly work with fish but you know a lot of our partners do and you know they have fish experts that are working um you know the aquatic side of things but uh it's mostly reptiles that that i personally am dealing with pythons being number one on the list tegus perhaps number two on my most wanted list and iguanas are close third uh, go on, you know, not all invasive animals have the same impacts, environmental impacts. Um, obviously, pythons are a huge ecological problem for Florida, whereas iguanas, we don't know much about their ecological impacts. They're mostly herbivorous, but they're burrowing animals, and um, they have implications to our agency's um, uh, kind of operations and maintenance. You know, we are we hail ourselves as the protectors of the Everglades, and we take the lead on most Everglades restoration projects. And um, we don't want an invasive animal burrowing into our levees and um, threatening one of our primary missions, which is flood control for over nine million residents in South Florida. Yeah. Wow. So, I. I I was wondering, would you be able to kind of expand on the differences between what is an invasive versus an exotic or like a naturalized uh, animal? Well, I'm really impressed with your questions, guys. Yes, absolutely. So when we say exotic or non-native, it just means that um, we're just talking animals here and plants certainly fall. You know, you can have um, native plants and non-native plants and invasive plants too. But um, non-native or exotic just means that it's not from a particular area originally. And um, um, they're usually they are brought into an area through um, a non-natural means. Usually it's humans that will uh, bring one species, um, a new, introduce a new species to an area. And then that's when it's considered exotic. Um, invasive. So native animals can be invasive too. Native plants can be invasive. Invasive ref- just means that it is um, spreading aggressively and and rapidly, and it tends to um, displace native species and uh, will outcompete native species for um resources and habitat so for instance um bald eagles are obviously a native animal in north america but in certain regions of alaska they've become uh, a nuisance um you'll see you can um look it up and you'll see bald eagles are becoming an issue in some towns of alaska and they might be considered an inv- going becoming invasive there um Normally, though, the term invasive refers to a non-native species. So we would say invasive exotic species. Hmm. I, see. Yeah, I think that's good to know because I know, I know um, like for carp, for example, like people like to toss around invasive or whatever. And I know that word gets kind of used interchangeably with, with exotic animals, but that's not necessarily the case. So I appreciate you kind of diving in a little bit more on that. I think that's really, really helpful. Yeah, it's not the case at all. Divisive does not mean exotic, uh, though that's, you know, it's often used uh, interchangeably with exotic, but yeah, not necessarily um, properly, like you mentioned. You also um, asked about a species being naturalized. So yes. a great example of that would be um, armadillos. So armadillos are from Texas, right? And mm-hmm. um, are now well established in Florida. And we think that that is uh, just due to kind of natural um, migration of of armadillos. You know, they didn't used to be found in Florida, but now they are. Are they considered uh, an exotic species in Florida? No, because they weren't introduced here 
Uh, we don't believe they were introduced here through non-natural means. We think that they came here basically naturally on their own, that that was inevitably going to happen. And so we consider that them to be naturalized. Coyotes are, you know, kind of debatable, a, a naturalized species in, in Florida now. That's interesting. I didn't know Florida had armadillos. Yeah, they sure do. I think I saw a couple of them on the on the road dead last time I went there. I went to uh, Defuniac Springs, and um, I think I saw a couple. I was like, is that an armadillo? I was like, I was probably a raccoon or something because I was driving in the middle of the night. And uh, I did the same thing. I didn't know armadillos were there, but it's good to know that uh, they have been seen. <laughs> and, and, yeah, we don't consider them a, a problem. So. So yeah, the Burmese python is definitely uh, an invasive in your book, I would assume. It's become the flagship of invasive species around the world. (laughs) So it's crazy to me to find out that the mortality rate of of them is 95%, but yet they're still expanding like they are and and causing a major issue. So what are the challenges in the control of them? The big challenge is detection. Um, You know, we mentioned how big these things are. They're Mm -hmm. almost invisible in the environment, though. They... um, they really well camouflaged in the environment. The environment itself, the Everglades, you know, people just think of Everglades National Park, which is a huge area, but the Everglades actually um, extends all the way from the Kissimmee Upper Chain of Lakes all the way down to Florida Bay, and it's just a, a just a hugely vast area that is largely inaccessible, and you know, it's hard to get into. Um, into these areas and then once you are it's really hard to see these animals unless you have a search you know the search image ingrained in your mind you know i see pythons in my sleep now if when i do sleep <laughs> um but most people will just walk right right past it because um they, they really blend in so well and um if you guys ever want to come down to the everglades uh, you're welcome to uh, come out with us and our partners and I can show you just what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, that is our biggest obstacle for management is just finding these animals. Once we find them, uh, we have nearly a hundred percent removal rate. Um, you know, a few get away obviously, but, um, you know, it's at least a 95% success rate for capture. You know, even the big ones, uh, you know, we have our, you know, fun stories to tell of catching these big animals and it can be epic catching some of these big ones, but um, really, you know, you just pick them up and get on with your day. It's not, it's not that difficult to capture them. It's finding them as a real problem. So we are constantly looking for ways that improve our ability to find these animals in the field. But right now, Human detection and removal is our most effective tool in a large toolbox. And I manage um, one of the contractor programs down here, the Python Elimination Program. I'm the principal developer and manager of that program. And that has, along with a sister program with our partners with FWC, the contractor programs are by far um, the most successful management efforts to date, but, um, and collectively those two programs were were approaching, uh, almost 14,000 pythons over the last seven years from those two programs. But, um, we're, you know, you want to use a, um, you want to use, um, kind of a diverse management strategy for, for this issue. You know, multiple strategies working in concert with one another is going to be our best path forward for the Python invasion. And we do have some other management efforts, and we're always looking for other ideas. So, you know, the another project we're involved in, we do a lot of research and development, and um, is Python telemetry. And so we are tracking... And us, you know, we're funding some of these projects and uh, some of our partnering agencies have their own telemetry projects happening. And this is where pythons are fitted with transmitters and tracked around the landscape. It helps us learn more about their life history and their non-native range. And then it also um, is a management strategy 
directly in that it can lead us to what we call associate stakes with these uh, so-called uh, scout programs, scout snake programs, where say a telemetered male python will lead us to a uh, reproductively active female, that kind of thing. I see. And our contractor programs are largely focused on these remote levees and roadways, and whereas the telemetry projects help us get into some of the interiors of um, of these areas impacted by pythons. And so you know, there's an example of two management strategies working together to try to cover an entire area. And I can go over some of the other um, management efforts that we're involved with as well, if you're interested. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear more about that. I do have a quick question, though, in terms of the behavior of them. So do they nest like singularly or do they have communities? Do they have larger nests? Uh, well, they'll, they'll well, mate in aggregations often, and they're called mating balls. But then a uh, female python will, will nest alone and okay. usually in hidden locations. Um, it could be um, under the ground, subterranean locations, like in tree roots or under a big thicket of grass are extremely hard to find these nests, but we're, we're getting better every year at finding these. Uh, but then, uh, you know, there's a couple, there's several different strategies that, that snakes in general use for reproduction, right? And, but Burmese pythons, mother, the mother will sit on the nest for two to three months. They'll vibrate their bodies and create, um, um, friction and create heat to help incubate these eggs and they'll and they'll guard these eggs um just ferociously so you know if you come across um a, f a female python on her nest she'll let you know about it <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> she doesn't take kindly to that they're they're really um protective mothers um but then as you would imagine uh, after the eggs hatch um the mother typically uh, goes on her way. There's not much nurturing that happens uh, <laughs> after that, but um, you know, after um, a day or two, uh, they seem to part ways. And um, I see. And the hatchling pythons are uh, born squeezers, is what I say. They know what to do right out of the egg and get right right to it. That's insane. Wow. Yeah, I was. I was. The reason why I asked that question was I was wondering if the uh, telemetry had made any difference in you know tracking a male or a. Or a uh, a transmitted animal back to a larger population of them or not? Uh, well, it certainly has led us to breeding aggregations. Mm -hmm. It has certainly led us to um, many, many pythons out in these interior locations along in, within the landscape that we would not have otherwise found. And um, the the inventors of Python telemetry in South Florida is the conservancy of Southwest Florida. And, um, my friend, uh, Ian Bartizek is a lead biologist over there. And he and his team, um, may actually be, uh, reducing the Python population in certain areas of Collier County where they're, uh, working. And that, you know, is such a great success story so far with those guys. And um, there are our agency, the University of Florida, USGS, the National Park Service are all um, also um, involved with these telemetry projects. So we're learning a lot about pythons. And the more we know about them, the more we learn about them, um, the more the better we understand them, the, the idea is that the, the more we're going to be able to remove down the road just because we understand and can predict their behavior, when and where they're going to be and why they're there. And, um, and then it's leading us to just to direct removals too through these uh, associate snakes that we find. I see. That definitely makes sense. So, yeah, I would love to come down there someday and actually uh, help out with the cause. Um, me and Jose have talked in the past about, you know, getting out there and catching, you know, what, what do we call it? We used to call it herping. We want to go herping. Yeah. <laughs> go, go catch some snakes. But, um, yeah, I feel like that would be something I'd love to do. So what is the method of actually capturing the snakes? Um, it's for, fairly simple. Um, put your phone down and uh, <laughs> grab the head. 
<laughs> we've, we've seen some people learn that lesson. But uh, yeah, pay attention to what you're doing and um, get control of the head first, uh, even though it's non-venomous and um, you know it's not normally a, a big deal if you get bit by one of these animals. We have seen some bad bites. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then control the rest of the body. So, so they're fairly easy to capture. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so while these snakes aren't venomous themselves, is there, um, I guess, any risk of like secondary infection just by the saliva and the other like bacteria in the mouth that people should be worried about? I suppose there there could be, um, but that's not, you know, normally um, much of a concern. Gotcha. Um, human bites are one of the worst animal bites you can. That can happen to you. So yeah, uh, it's not the bite <laughs> itself so much that yeah. you, that are the concern with them. Just um, trying to um, try to find these things, and then if you're on a really big one, you know you have to. If you grab that head, then you know don't let go. You're you're dedicated at that point. So. <laughs> but uh, you know, they're these pythons aren't out attacking humans. They're not biting people for no reason. Uh, just to defend themselves as anything would, right? Yeah. So the approach and, and, you know, capturing one is obviously physically grabbing the head. What other innovative approaches are there? Like, I think I read something about there's a bounty on them over a certain size or something like that going on. So that's the contractor programs um, that I mentioned. Um, okay. So they are bounty programs and uh, we prefer to use the term incentive. Uh, <laughs> that's a kind of a softer term for, <laughs> for government, I guess, but um, it is, it is a bounty and we, we pay our contractors, and uh, there are currently a hundred paid um, Python contractors in Florida. They're gov- they're uh, contracted by two state agencies, either ours, the South Florida Water Management District, or our partnering agency, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission (FWC). Each agency has fifty hunters. It's we call ourselves one big team managed by two separate agencies. But so I manage 50 of those contractors. We pay them hourly to search the designated project area, which covers 11 counties right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a variable rate depending on location. But then we pay um, a incentive or bounty for every python removed, and that's based on length. We pay $50 for the first four feet and then $25 per foot for every foot after four. So uh, an eight foot Python would be worth $150 to a contractor. Oh, wow. Now here's something interesting. The Python Nation program, the one that I um, developed and, and, and still run, uh, we paid cash bounties for the first year and a half, seven days a week. We we're open holidays, Christmas, my birthday. You know, we didn't care. It was just, we were open seven days a week. <laughs> and, um, and we were paying cash bounties. It was must have been the only government agency in the last hundred years <laughs> paying. Uh, it was kind of like the Wild West <laughs> out there. And um, you know, we we really wanted to do everything we could to incentivize and encourage these expert snake hunters that we that we uh, manage mm-hmm. to to really get at this issue. And they and they have. We couldn't sustain the cash system for more than a year and a half, and um, believe me, it was challenging to sustain it for that long. But um, we now pay the contractors weekly uh, via direct deposit. It was the first time in our agency's history where we're paying any contractors via direct deposit. We were paying check before yeah. this program. So I'm really proud of that. I wanted to preserve the instant gratification as best I could for the contractors Mm-hmm. And they get paid once a week, whereas I only get paid every two weeks. So, you know, yeah. we really treat these contractors well, and um, they are the, the best snake catchers in the world. And we have such a big issue down here that um, – and I manage the team very, very closely and have a, a strong working relationship with this um, 
kind of eccentric group. <laughs> there are a bunch of characters, <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, Everglades yeah. Python hunters. Like, what what could go wrong with a bunch of Everglades Python hunters? <laughs> right? What a <laughs> sick job title that is. I mean, the resume. That's awesome. So it's. You know, we I hear about um, other industries having trouble finding staff and employees, right? Well, not this program. We get 100 applications every single week from all over the world. And it, we have an extremely low turnover rate. And uh, so very few openings and a huge list of people waiting to get in. So it's extremely competitive and selective to become one of, one of our contractors. That's awesome, though. So it's so it's not like a, a public incentivized thing, because uh, in Texas they have a major hog issue, and in right. certain counties they'll have a bounty for hogs. Uh, but it's just anybody that's out recreating outdoors. It's it's not a specific contract you don't have to apply for. So right. there, it, it is a, a specific position. It is, yep, okay. and uh, it's competitive, just like you know, with most um, with most jobs that you would apply for, or more so. There's yeah. also a bounty program on Nutria in Louisiana that you may have heard of, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that's open to the general public. But um, no, this uh, you have to apply for and be selected and be a registered con- state contractor I see. To, to be um, compensated to remove pythons. The general public is encouraged to humanely remove pythons from most state-managed lands in Florida, but... Um, uh, only those registered contractors actually get paid to do it. I see. That makes sense. So what can the public do other than capturing them? Um, what, what else can the public do to be involved and help with the, help with the cause? Yeah. Thanks for that question. You know, I mentioned that Burmese pythons are now illegal to own in Florida. They're illegal to transport um, live or to um, buy or sell or, or move across state lines alive. Uh, so the public shouldn't be shouldn't have any pythons any any longer in their homes. I'm sure there's a few you know illegal mm-hmm. ones being held, but uh, in general, I think uh, the python invasion is a great example of uh, why we don't release uh, exotic animals into into the environment. Um, we'd like for people to get the word out there. Um, if you are uh, if you work in in or near some of the natural areas of um, South Florida, or somebody that you know does, uh, keep an eye out for them. And if if you see one, please um, there's there's a hotline you can call. It's one eight eight eight. I've got one. I don't. You'd have to look up the numbers for that. But there's an app too. It's the I've Got One app. And uh, our agency wouldn't uh, appreciate me giving my cell phone number out over your podcast, <laughs> but um, you know, I uh, people can contact me as well. And um, no matter where the Python is across Florida, if a report comes to me, and I, I stay available twenty four seven, three sixty five on this issue, um, uh, the average uh, removal time for one gets reported to me is about an hour. Oh, wow. So the contractor programs are not only they're unique in that they're bounty programs, but um, we employ a lot of technology with them too. We have customized apps on their smartphones. They're uh, customized uh, Esri products. Uh, Esri is the global GIS leader. Uh, they, they have the app Waze you might use. Um, um, you using Esri products, whether you know it or not. Right. Uh, but we're using Esri products. and. Um, uh, through these apps, uh, I'm able to um, track our Python hunters in real time across the Everglades day and night. And so when I come home from, from work, I don't watch football or baseball. I turn on my computer and I watch uh, the Python <laughs> contractors moving across the landscape. That's awesome. Um, but, you know, I can, I can see where they're at um, in relation to the project area, in relation to other contractors. And if a Python gets reported by the, by the public, um, I can see who, who's the closest to, to that area. If I'm not, you know, myself, you know, able to respond, Uh, but bottom line, you know, I've got, um, you know, at least 50 to a hundred people, you know, 
on speed dial and ready to uh, respond to any of these sightings. And you know, all these people are like me; they're snake lovers. Um, I need to emphasize that um, all these removals that we do are, are humane, and um, it's really important that these animals be respected, like the living creatures that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they have to be euthanized. Um, at the end of the day, but um, though that needs to be done in strict um, protocols according to American Veterinary Medical Association guidelines. We take that extremely seriously, but um, the people that I manage, they're all a very, very passionate like me about protecting our native wildlife while respecting you know that this is a living creature that we're dealing with. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, we have really great team of people that will get out there right away and uh, remove that animal before it can cause any more damage to our uh, beautiful ecosystem here, right? So, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's one thing that me and Jose, we're both passionate about wildlife. We're passionate about conservation. And we've had conversations in the past where it's it's difficult to for some people to understand that even though we are euthanizing or harvesting certain animals, it's, it's out of love and care for the ecosystem. And some people think, you know, uh, well, oh, you're just out there killing something. And that's not the case. And so to hear that y'all are doing it humanely and responsibly and, you know, exp it, emphasizing on the fact that you guys are animal lovers, like I, I, just, I thank you for saying that. <laughs> of course. Yeah, it's, it's super important to me. You know, I've had family members say, you know, isn't it ironic you being such a snake lover, you're in charge of this program that, you know, has to put these animals down. In a way, it is ironic. Uh, but um, and the day I become desensitized to it is the day I quit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And I have to remind myself of the big picture each and every time. And I would never ask someone to do something, you know, that I, I myself wasn't willing to do. Um, so, you know, I, I take this issue very seriously. And if I wasn't doing this, then somebody else would be, right? And mm -hmm. I'm really glad to be in charge of this because I, I take this so seriously. I don't allow um, pictures of dead pythons on uh, mainstream or social media. Um, you know, you see trophy hunters and they'll be out there with their, you know, a dead deer or whatever. And I'm not judging or criticizing those people, uh, but that's just not how I want this program to be run. You know, this yeah. is not a snake killing program. Mm -hmm. This is a native animal saving program. And I think that that's the public message. Absolutely. For this. What a line. That's quite the quote there. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, I can't take credit for it. Uh, if he's out there listening, it's uh, my, my friend and former colleague, Ed Metzger, that said that. Well, I think it's very fitting. Yeah. For sure. Also, I'm, I'm curious. It probably be, it probably would have been more appropriate to ask you at the beginning of the podcast, but since you're kind of touching on it now, how did you find yourself in in you know into the the position you are now? Like, how did that all pan out? Well, that's a long story, and I'm kind of <laughs> running out of time tonight. We might yeah. have to have uh, this might have to be a two parter, but um, I can tell you it was. Uh, I'll give you um, I'll give you a, a, just the brief summary of this. So. I am still in the vegetation management department of our agency to this day as an artifact of where I was when I um, started the Python Elimination Program, which has since uh, kind of ballooned into um, all these other management efforts, Python challenges, all the stuff that you see is all, all really stems back from the work that we did seven years ago on this. But um, I was working with invasive plants at the time and um our executive director at the time his name was pete antonacci he's uh, passed away a couple of years ago but um he he was rick scott's personal defense attorney and you know, he was um in charge of our um agency at the time he saw a video of a a viral video of a python easily holding an alligator underwater and suffocating it um, out of uh, Big Cypress National Preserve. And um, Pina Tanachi got very, very upset at this video, and he, he called um, our bureau chief up into his office and said, hey, we need to do something about this. And um, uh, bureau chief came down and said, um, you know, with these marching orders and, and 
I said, hey, who's the snake guy of the group? You know, I've got, got these marching orders. And uh, somebody spoke up and said, I think Kirkland might be interested in snakes. They had no idea, really. But um, <laughs> they brought me into this conference room, and they said they wanted me to um, put on a pilot program, a three-month pilot program, a bounty program, um, hire 25, you know, develop, implement, manage this program where we're paying 25 Python hunters um, cash bounties, and we gave them unprecedented access to, to our lands. And um, do this all while doing a regular day job, and uh, and you should probably kill this after three months because it's a crazy idea and go back to your regular <laughs> job after that. <laughs> and everyone thought it was a crazy idea, uh, but um, but me, I, you know, what my leadership didn't fully appreciate at the time, and they do now. Um, you know, I've always been um, a snake person, and I. I saw this as uh, an opportunity. And so I took this um, kind of haste, hastily planned idea and immediately started uh, talking to experts and friends and family and worked around the clock to make this into a viable program that it is today. Um, wow. But um, it was not expected to succeed at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. They said three months, and you said seven years now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, you know, I kind of famously make myself available to uh, all of our Python hunters um, twenty four hours a day. I, I really don't sleep much, but Pythons are um, mostly caught at night, mm-hmm. and um, you know, so I you know work my <clears throat> regular hours during the day but uh i really stay available to these guys uh, all night long as best as i can i am human i do sleep a little bit but probably not way not not enough but um <laughs> you know if you have contractors out in the everglades 24 hours a day seven days a week i think it's really really important to have a manager available to them oh, and so sure. anytime that they capture they have to text me in real time so my phone's just going off all night long with um capture photos and if they have any issues out there i mean it's an extremely dynamic environment out there especially at night and um you know i'm uh able to respond faster than 911 often you know when these guys contact me I'm, i um have preserved my marriage but a lot of my uh personal life otherwise has gone to the wayside and this <laughs> this uh program has just consumed me but i'm super passionate about it that's good. It sounds yeah, like that you're awesome. a man of wearing many hats. I mean, whether you're a dispatcher or a project coordinator, I mean, it seems like you do anything and everything involved in it. So uh, I'm sure you are passionate about it. And it's good that you are, because I can guarantee that if somebody else that wasn't passionate was in your position, that they wouldn't be putting that much effort. So. Yeah, it just seems to be what I was uh, born to do. <laughs> Thank you to you and your team for, for doing what you're doing and, and conserving the natural state of Florida. And it, I think it's uh, your mission is, is truly impressive and i wish uh wish you all the best yeah thank you very much and i uh, appreciate you guys um you know highlighting this issue you know it's people like you that um help get the word out there and uh, help keep you know the support uh that, that we need to to keep these important management efforts going and uh if you guys ever want to come down uh, my office in west, west palm beach and you'll be happy to go out with um me or one of our um one of our paid hunters and um, get you some um, field experience down here. Yeah. That sounds like a good time. I will definitely be in touch. <laughs> yeah, I think Russ and I can try and work something out. <laughs> yeah. We'd be happy to have you. <laughs> well, we appreciate you hopping on and we appreciate, you know, your expertise and all the information and um, you're always welcome off for a part two. Cause I feel like there's a lot more deep that we can go into, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So, um, yeah, if you ever want to do a part two, we'd love to have you on again, but thank you for helping on this. Yeah. Just let me know. There's definitely a lot more to, to talk about. And, um, uh, but now I'm going to lose my voice if we keep going tonight. So yeah, let's <laughs> save that for part two. Awesome. Well, sounds it sounds great. like a plan. And, uh, to the listeners, if y'all made it to the end, thank y'all for listening and, uh, we'll catch y'all next time. This has been wildlife outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at wildlife outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.